Hi, this is Bob, the old ham. When I was working at Heathkit in 1980, 1981, right around in there, I was uh, first working in the service department, and one of the rigs I worked on a lot was the HW2036 and the HW2036A two-meter synthesized transceivers. Uh, this is an example here of the 2036A. This one here is the HW2036. I got two of these. I bought them real cheap. I, I paid uh, very little for these. And uh, they are often sold for very little at ham fests and things like that. This one here, I think I paid $15 for. And it came with a bonus here. It had the micoder mic on it, which is a good microphone for this rig. I really don't need the uh, touchpad, but uh, the microphone works really good and it's nice to have a microphone come with it. Now these rigs really work good, but there are some things that you should know if you're going to work on one. First of all, this little coil right here. You see that little coil is blue. If you have a blue coil, that means that this has been, this has been uh, modified with the parts necessary to make it an HW2036A. And I have written that on the VCO case here. So if you have a blue coil there, then it's been modified. If you've got a yellow coil, then it's still the original HW2036. The difference being that the HW2036 will operate only over 2 megahertz of the 2 meter band. And you have to align it for either uh, 144 to 146 or 146 to 148. You cannot do the whole band. But if you have a modified unit or a 2036A that was made that way originally, you can use it over the full 4 megahertz of the 2 meter band. So like I say, look for the blue coil. If you got a yellow coil, then you'll have to modify it. You have to change uh, two little capacitors inside the VCO here. Uh, you change those and you change the uh, coil to the blue one. Where in the world you're going to get a blue coil, I don't know these days. Maybe you could take the yellow one and rewind it or something or make another coil, but you need a, a coil with more inductance for the 2036A. I think it's 0.65 microhenries, and I think the one that comes with it, the yellow one, if you have one that's not modified, is 0.27 microhenry, so it's like twice as much. All right, so I wanted to mention that. I also wanted to mention the fact that these knobs sometimes will push on too far, and if they do, they will jam. And I took this one apart and found out that it was jamming because the base of this knob slipped over the nut tightly and you couldn't turn the knob. I thought the thing was frozen or something, but when I took the knob off, I found out it wasn't. So I put a washer with a quarter inch hole behind this knob so you can't push it on too far and there's no problem with it jamming again. Uh, some of the other things that I run into also here, I want to show you something that's very important. If you are working on an HW2036 or an HW2036A, you want to put screws in here where the back panel is held on. When you put this in the case, these hold the case on. So if you take this out of the case, you remove these. Well, don't try to tune it up and all with those out, because if you do, you will probably have a difficult time getting it to tune, and the VCO phase lock loop will drop out of lock, and you'll wonder what's going on here. And sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't, because sometimes you get a connection between these standoff bushings, and sometimes you won't. So, be sure to put some screws in the back so that you can get that taken care of. Now, I aligned these two on 145 megahertz. It seems to me that they align better and they still cover the full, the full 4 megahertz of the band. When I aligned these on 146 megahertz per the manual, then it would not operate between 145 and 144 for some reason. But I aligned them on 145 megahertz, and it works all the way for the whole band. So you might want to remember to align this on 145 megahertz if you have that problem where it doesn't transmit over the lower megahertz, the lower one megahertz of the band. 
And what else have I got here? I think that's pretty much covers things. They are a good little rig. Uh, they go and go and go, and you can work on them. Now, one of the things I've done with these is remove the ICs, clean the IC pins. I uh, used a uh, an X-Acto knife to clean the pins on the ICs, and I ground strap on my wrist so that I didn't uh, hurt anything with static electricity. I cleaned the ICs. I put a very tiny bit of silicon grease. I put it onto a piece of circuit board and you can see there's a glob of, of silicon grease there I just take my finger and I dab it on there and I get a tiny bit on and I wipe it on the pins of those ICs after I had shined them up by scraping them with the X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade you can use a little pocket knife uh, and you can also use pencil erasers to do that with too. If they are tarnished lightly, a pencil eraser works best. But if they're tarnished really bad, like these were, the X-Acto knife is the way to go. So I cleaned all those. I also took these little pins and I shoved them on and off about six times, each one. You see these, these little pins slide off here, and there's, you'll see a lot of them. Here's, a, here's another one right here and each of these wires has got one on it then you, you pull those off. I use a pair of long nose pliers to pull those off and do it carefully or you can pull it right off the end of the wire anyhow uh, what I did put them on about six times take them off and then I put a tiny tiny bit of that silicon grease on a little tiny screwdriver and stick it inside the connector or you can use a piece of wire I have a piece of wire here that I use for that it's just a piece of uh, of old wire like from a paper clip and I dip that into that silicon grease and I put it inside those connectors I did that with all of these connectors here all the connectors here all the connectors on the underside of the board and I also scraped and cleaned all the pins on the on the ICs on the other side of the board to get rid of any intermittent connections another thing I do is I go through and I make sure that all of the nuts and screws are tightened down. Uh, you will find quite often people didn't tighten them. So I get my nut driver out. I got a nut driver here with a small end on it. I take that. I tighten all of these down nice and snug. I go on the other side, tighten them all down nice and snug. I take a small screwdriver. I tighten down the screws here on the VCO. And Back here, I use a quarter inch open end wrench, a little tiny one, and tighten these up a little bit. Get them nice and, you don't have to tighten them up super tight, but nice and snug because you want good connections there. And when people assemble these kits, quite often they did not tighten those hardware down, and those hardware are ground connections, and the thing may not work right. Okay, another thing to talk about here, right here. There's a ground connection right here that goes to the microphone. And you will notice right here, there's a 100 ohm resistor right there. What I did, there's a yellow wire that comes in under here. Right there's a yellow wire that goes to the LEDs. I put a small wire on that. That's this blue wire. It goes to this 100 ohm resistor. The 100 ohm resistor then, this is looped back. You see it just loops up and around like that and back. That's tied to the black wire that goes to the microphone. Now in the microphone you take that black wire off. Be sure you do that and take that black wire off of ground in the microphone. You clip off the battery connector wires on the switch and then you connect that black wire to the same place where the red wire connected. Now you've got 12 volts coming from this little yellow wire going through here through the black wire going up to your mic coder to run your mic coder and you don't have to have a battery in there anymore and that is really convenient especially if you're like me and you leave the battery in a long time and then it leaks all over inside there so that's a good thing to eliminate that battery in the mic coder and a lot of people don't know about that uh, some other things that loosen up on these these uh, these big bushings here these threaded bushings these things loosen up you got to take the cover off of the uh, VCO 
and then you got to loosen up the B VCO circuit board. Under the circuit board you will find a plastic screw. Uh, you want to take that plastic screw out of there, put a standard 632 screw in there with a small head that is not too thick and tighten it down nice and tight. I used a lock washer on I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't put a lock washer on it because it was too thick. I just used a plain old 632 pan head screw uh, to hold this down. It goes on this one here. And you may have to get under there and tighten the other one up too, which is here. And to do that, you got to take this circuit board out. you got to take this circuit board loose, fold it back, and you can tighten up the screw under there. But you don't want this thing moving around. So you want to test it try to move it when you get a rig to work on try to move that if it moves then you got a problem uh, but the first thing to do is to replace that plastic screw once you get the plastic screw replaced then you put an extra lock washer underneath each of the screws that hold the little circuit board in that gives you another few thousandths of an inch clearance so that you can use a standard steel screw there those plastic screws work loose every time so you want to get that taken care of if you're working on one of these. If you get these rigs working, they work beautifully. Now one of the characteristics of this is that it has a little bit of synthesizer noise that comes on there that people can hear when you're transmitting. And they'll say, oh, you got your PL turned up too loud or something like that, or you got alternator whine. No, these have a little bit of synthesizer noise in them, and it says right in the manual, it's printed in here. I don't know where, but I remember reading it. It's printed in here that you should expect that synthesizer noise, but it should be down so it doesn't really bother people. But it's there, so people may comment on it. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, yes, the, uh, the PL generators in these, they're not the best. Uh, but if you're using one inside, the, inside your QTH, uh, you can you can use them and if you if you'll notice here right at this point you see that's a little tiny trim pot that little black one right there I have that little trim pot it's a 25,000 ohm trim pot I've got a 4700 ohm resistor in series with it that connects to ground I just soldered it to the circuit board right there the other end of that has the, the little tiny wire looped around the end of that 100,000 ohm resistor there. That one right there, right at that point. And I soldered it. That's really difficult to do because it's so close to the circuit board. But I did get it in there and it works fine. You want to check that with your ohm meter. Be sure you don't short out to the board there. Anyhow, what that does is that reduces the PL amount by a considerable amount because they made a huge mistake on these. And the huge mistake is that they set them up on the engineering guys, the engineering guys had set these up for uh, PL deviation of 2000 Hertz. Way too much. So you want to get it down to a couple hundred, maybe 300 Hertz deviation for the PL. So you want to put that little 25K pot in there and that little 4700 ohm resistor. I think perhaps if you just put a 33K resistor from the end of that 100K resistor to ground, this one right here on that end, right where that yellow tool is, is ending, the, the diddle stick, uh, you put a, I think about a 33K from there to ground if you don't have one of these pots and I think it'll work just fine. But that cuts your PL deviation way down. And I guess that's it. Now I haven't had any trouble with the PL deviation on this. I've run it for two days now and it's worked just fine because a lot of people say well you can't use the PL in these units and I would agree with them up until two days ago when I found out what the big problem was really that it was too much deviation and not that the frequency was off. So I lined those both with my frequency counter right for the exact frequency for the, the local repeaters. I got all three of them in here lined up. So I guess that's it guys. These are all my uh, tips uh, for the uh, HW2036A. Don't forget to put a little bit of uh, your silicon grease on the pins of all your connectors when you put them back together. That silicon grease is a dielectric grease and it will enhance the connections actually over just not having anything on there. So that's it guys, 73's and good DX.